Okay, so as I promised, I'd like to start today by talking about scissors congruence. And let me just describe the history of scissors congruence. Um, it was actually a, a very major topic of interest during the 19th century. Um, lots of famous mathematicians thought about it, like Gauss and so on. And then Hilbert formulated his problem. This is Hilbert's third problem of his famous problem list of 1900. And the problem was, can you subdivide the cube, the Euclidean cube, of let's say a fixed volume, volume one, into, so you subdivide it along planes, so it, you subdivide it into polyhedral pieces, so into polyhedral pieces, and reassemble these pieces. So you glue the pieces together again to get the regular tetrahedron. So a regular tetrahedron. Again, of course, the volume has to be unchanged. So this had been a long-standing problem at the time he formulated it, and he formulated it as one of the important problems. And in all of his problems, he gives a long discussion. And in his long discussion, he asks more generally, if you've got two polyhedra of the same volume, can you subdivide one and glue it together to the other? And it's very clear from the tone of the discussion that he expects the answer to be no. So he was implicitly conjecturing that the answer is no. And this was the first of the Hilbert problems to be solved. It was solved the same year by Max Dane. So Dane solved this. The answer is indeed no, as Hilbert predicted. So I'd like to describe this first. So this is scissors congruence in three-dimensional Euclidean geometry. It has been known for a long time that in two dimensions, in two-dimensional Euclidean geometry, also in hyperbolic and spherical geometry, the solution to the corresponding problem is yes. If you have polygons in one of these geometries of the same area, you can subdivide and re-glue to turn one into the other. And that's a nice exercise to do. But in three dimensions, this was unknown, and the answer was no. So we'll formalize this will define a group that I'll call the polygon group for E3. This is going to be, we take the free Z module, the polytope group, the free Z module on congruence classes of Euclidean polytopes. So a polytope is simply some, some three-dimensional object that is bounded by planar surfaces and a finite volume, compact finite volume polytope. So we take this free Z module and then we factor by the relation of scissors congruence. So the scissors congruence relation is we say the class of P is equal to the class of P1 plus the class of P2. If you can cut P along a plane into the pieces P1 and P2. If you can cut P by a plane into P1 disjoint union P2. Okay, and generate this scissors process, of course, you can generate more complicated cutting then, and this is the module. 
Okay. And we can re now reformulate Hilbert's problem. We clearly have the mapping from PE3 to the real numbers, which is a surjective mapping given by volume. Okay, since we're taking a free Z module, we're allowing negative summands, so we have volume here. And Hilbert's problem was, is this an isomorphism? And as I said, Hilbert expected the answer to be no. And Dane's answer, here we've got one invariant on this group. Dane's answer was to give a different invariant which was independent. So the Dane invariant is a very simple and beautiful invariant. It's a mapping from PE3 to, we take R and we tensor it with R modulo rational multiples of pi. This and this are both Q vector spaces, so we tensor as Q vector spaces. There. Huge dimensional Q vector spaces, but nevertheless we can do this. So this is still an uncountable dimensional Q vector space. And the way that we do this, if we have some sort of a polytope, here's a polytope, okay, then we have edges to this polytope and each edge of the polytope has a length. We can talk about the length of the edge, which is just the length. And we also have a dihedral angle at the edge, which we'll call theta of the edge. Okay? And what we do is, given a polytope, or the class of a polytope in P of E3, we map it to the sum over all of the edges of the polytope of the length tensor the dihedral angle. And the dihedral angle is only well defined up to multiples of 2 pi, and that's why we only look at the angle up to rational multiples of 2 pi. You could write here R modulo integral multiples of 2 pi tensored over the integers, because these are divisible groups, that's automatically the same as tensoring over the rationals and factoring by q pi. That's a little exercise. So it's easier to write it immediately in this way. So this is a nice invariant, and it's very easy to see, and it's an exercise that delta is the Dane invariant is well defined on P E3. The point being that if you cut by a plane, so here I'm cutting by some plane, what have I done? I've created some new edges with length. So I get a length times dihedral angle, but the I have a length times one dihedral angle and another dihedral angle. The two new dihedral angles I've created add up to a multiple of pi. So I get length times something that's zero in the second factor for these things. Or I might cut through a, along a plane that goes along an edge, and then I've just divided this term into a summand with equal length. So it's not too hard to see that however you cut by a plane, so the relation that we had there for generating scissors congruence doesn't change the Dane invariant. And what's also an exercise is volume and Dane invariant are independent invariants. This concept of independence of invariance is a nice concept. All it means is that if you know the one, if you know the one invariant, it tells you nothing about the value of the other. And that's actually a symmetric relationship. You can prove that if you know the one, if we're knowing the one tells you nothing about the other, then it works the other way around. 
And algebraically, you can show that it's equivalent to saying that the kernel of volume and the kernel of the data invariant actually generate the whole of the group that we're taking the invariant on. And that's how you, that's one of way of seeing the symmetry of this relationship of being independent. But the independence immediately tells us, oh, one other thing I should say is that, um, one final thing is that volume restricted to the kernel of the data invariant is, which is a mapping from the kernel of the data invariant to R, this is still surjective. And so you have Well, to, to go back to this example, for instance, the angles here are irrational. It's very easy to see that this has non-zero data invariant. The cube, on the other hand, only has rational angles, has zero data invariant. So the answer for the specific example is zero, is no, answering Hilbert's question. But in general, there'll be very many um, things with equal volume that don't have the same data invariant and are therefore not scissors congruent. So, so this was the answer, but as many answers, it raises lots of other questions. As soon as you answer one question, there are lots more. And the obvious questions are, what happens with other geometries? And, well, there are, a, a more immediate question is actually, Hilbert asked about volume. We now have volume and Dane invariant. Are volume and Dane invariant enough to tell whether two things are scissors congruent? And that was proved a lot later. This was a theorem of Zudler who was a, he was the librarian at, uh, what's it called, the Institute in Switzerland, famous, ETH. He was the librarian at ETH, worked for many years on this problem, and uh, in, what was the date, 1965, he published a proof that if you take volume and Dane invariant together, they give you an injective map. In other words, they are sufficient invariance to um, to detect scissors congruence. So. One immediately has the questions, what is the case, what about other geometries? So, what about En for n greater than or equal to 4? What about Hn for n greater than or equal to 3? That wasn't solved at the time. Or what about spherical geometry for n greater than or equal to 3? But of course, Hn for n equal to 3 is the one that interests us here. But let me say a little bit about the answers of these to these. Um, not too long after Sudel approved this theorem, Jensen, a Danish mathematician, gave a simplification of his proof. It's basically the same proof, but formulated using algebraic topological methods, using cohomology theory which simplifies it. And he also made an observation, and it turns out to be nothing more than an observation, that this theorem in dimension 3 implies the same theorem in dimension 4. In dimension 4, you also have a Dane invariant. You look at co-dimension 2 faces, and you take the 
area of those faces tends to again with dihedral angles. Okay, so so E four is okay. N greater than four is totally unknown. When those there are data invariants for every even codimension, so once you get to up to E five, you have two. Two Dane invariants, the code I mentioned two and the code I mentioned four Dane invariants. The conjecture is that they are enough together with volume, but it's not known. So this is unknown. And as I'll say, in dimension three and above, for hyperbolic and spherical geometry, there's still a lot unknown as well. But now I'd like to concentrate on H3. And as I talk about H3, everything I say about the H3 geometry is actually true for the S3 geometry. I'll say some words about it, but I'll tend to just write down H3 as I talk. So, so I'm going to look at scissors congruence. So the, sorry, the polygon what was I calling it? P, but P of H3. So the Sillers congruence group for H3. So I'm looking at hyperbolic polytopes modulo Sillers congruence. And it's not too hard to see that when we were talking about Euclidean geometry, we used compact polytopes. When you're talking about hyperbolic geometry, there are two choices. You could restrict to compact polytopes, or you could talk about polytopes of finite volume, and finite volume still allows ideal vertices. And it's an exercise to show that those two are the same thing. So, so we may as well assume the more general polytopes in this case, allowing ideal vertices. The basic Here's a hint about the exercise. If you've got a corner of a polytope with some sort of a cross section, um, you can cut off this corner. Well, you can subdivide the. You can subdivide into various congruent versions. So you can something that's going off to infinity. You can subdivide into several congruent versions. And because we're allowing addition and subtraction in the scissors congruence group, this allows us to kind of cancel away place ideal vertices of polytopes and cut and paste any ideal polytope into one that only has finite vertices. So that's basically the idea underlying why we can allow ideal vertices. Now then, we again have a Dane invariant, so pH3 going to R tensor R modulo pi Q. You have to be a little bit careful now if you're allowing ideal vertices. The trick that you do for an ideal vertex is you cut off the ideal vertex by a horospherical boundary here and just measure out to the boundary, because we need lengths here in order to define the whole thing. When we do this cutting, we have a cross section where the angles add up to pi. And that tells us that it doesn't really matter where we do the cutting. If we change where the cutting is, we're changing the whole sum by a length times a sum of angles that add up to pi, and that's zero in the group where the Dane invariant is computed. So you still have the Dane invariant defined. And the question that was answered by Sudler in the E3 case is again, are volume and Dane invariant sufficient? So are volume and Dane invariant sufficient? Yes, you can allow, so as I was saying, 
you can allow ideal points or not allow them, and it does not make a difference. So, so I said, if you've got an ideal um, polygon, what you, what you do is you cut off by a horror ball at each vertex. So you cut off each vertex to get, to get something finite. And then you do the Dane invariant just using the, these edges and ignoring everything that goes on to infinity. And where you cut doesn't make a difference because if you change where you cut, you're changing by a length tensored with a sum of angles that add up to a multiple of pi. And so that's how you define the Dane invariant in this case if you've got ideal vertices. So, let, let me write this down as an equation, vol and delta from P of H3 to R plus R tensor R mod pi Q. Is this injective? And the conjecture is that this is true. And also for spherical geometry. But this is an open conjecture. And a long-standing and very interesting open conjecture. So let me reformulate this now. If you think about it, and volume is the more familiar invariant, but Dane invariant is really the more elementary invariant. The Dane invariant is defined only using one-dimensional measure, angle measure and length measure. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce a notation for the kernel. D of H3 is going to be the kernel of the Dane invariant from P of H3 to R tensor R modulo pi R. And then, then this question becomes, or this conjecture becomes, the conjecture that the map from the, from the data invariant kernel to R given by volume that this is injected. Okay. Notice that in the, if we look at the corresponding thing in the Euclidean case, it's not just injectives. Zudler's theorem is saying that this is actually an isomorphism in the Euclidean case. Because in the Euclidean case, if you've got something of zero Dane invariant of a certain volume, you can just scale it by a similarity and vary the volume continu continuously, and the Dane invariant will stay zero. So this is an isomorphism for Euclidean geometry, but it's a theorem of DuPont that the, images, the image of this map is countable. also for S3. So a very different behavior from Euclidean, Euclidean geometry. The volume, there are only finite, there are only countably many volumes of things with zero Dane invariant. Just a little bit more about these groups. And these groups, w this group was created by taking a free Z module modulo subrelations. So a priori, it's just a Z module. But it is a theorem that puts together work of a lot of different people. I'll just say the names. It's Bickstedt, Brun, um, DuPont, Saar, and one other, 
Dupont uh, and uh, oh Suslin and Parry, two more, which say that if you look at these groups, all of these groups, P of H3, P of S3, P of E3, and their dated variant kernels, D of H3, D of S3, D of E3, these are all Q vector spaces. So this is very surprising. Okay, as I said, a priori they're just Z modules. What this is saying is that they all turn out to be uniquely divisible groups. And, and actually, this leads to very nice puzzle side. If you take something of zero data invariant like the cube, and then take a cube of exactly a third of the volume, here's a cube of exactly the third, a third of the volume, what this is saying is that there's some way of cutting and pasting three of the cubes of one third the volume. I drew that a little bit large, but anyway. Huh. Should be a little smaller, but I write down a cube with one third of the volume. There is some way of doing scissors congruence, subdividing this big cube into pieces that can be re reassembled into three of the smaller cubes. And it's not completely obvious how you do that. I mean, it's, and, and if you solve three, then you can try to do four, five, and so on. And there's no general method known for doing this. Uh, each one is currently an individual problem of its own. It comes out of cohomological calculations that it can be done. So, in particular, if we look at the image of volume, volume of D of H3, the set of volumes of things with zero data invariant, this is a subset of R, we know that this is countable by DuPont's theorem, it's a Q vector space by this theorem, so it's a countable dimensional Q vector space. The conjecture is that the dimension is countably infinite. But it's absolutely shocking that we can't even prove that this set of volumes doesn't just consist of the rational numbers. I'd I should say it's known that every single one of these volumes is irrational, but it's not proved that a sing any one of them is irrational. And one knows simply by experimental evidence. The experimental evidence is overwhelming that the dimension is indeed countably infinite, but there's really nothing proved about this set of volumes. So it's a pretty shocking situation, and the same situation holds for S3. So this is trying to prove trans transcendence results for these volumes, and volumes of hyperbolic objects and of spherical polyhedra are computed via dialogarithm functions, so it's transcendence results for special values of the dialogarithm. Now then, to get back to the main topic here, let's suppose we have M3, a hyperbolic manifold. A finite volume. So let's draw it. Here is our M3, a hyperbolic manifold of finite volume. And what we'll do is we'll simply triangulate it. We'll subdivide it into simplices three-dimensional simplices in some way. And in this way, by subdividing it into simplices or larger polytopes, we get a class for M3 
the scissors congruence class, I'll call it SC of M3, this is going to be an element of the scissors congruence group of the polytope group P of H3. But notice that the Dane invariant is very easily seen to be zero. If we take any edge, that edge in the Dane invariant contributes its length tensored with the sum of the angles around the edge. But the sum of the angles around the edge is 2 pi. So it's zero in our factor Q R modulo multiples of pi. So this is actually in the Dane invariant kernel. In this very interesting group, the Dane invariant kernel. So the series congruence class of F3 manifold is in this Dane invariant kernel. And now then, what is this Dane invariant kernel? Well, in fact, we've already seen it. It turns out, so this is a theorem mostly DuPont and Saar, but also putting in ingredients from other people. which says that if we look at the block group B of C, so B of C was this algebraically group, uh, this group that I defined by taking shapes of simply C's modulo the five term relation that came through a scissors congruence relation, a, a cutting and pasting relation, but a cutting and pasting relation that was restricted to only use planes that kept only ideal vertices. So B, and, B of C is kind of scissors congruence where you're only allowed polytopes with ideal vertices. You're not allowed, allowed any finite vertices. Now, it, we defined it algebraically in terms of the parameter, so in terms of C. And the definition, if we, the conjugation on C induces a involution on B of C. So there's an automorphism of this group given by conjugation of C. And we can look at the minus 1 eigenspace. So I define this to be the minus 1 eigenspace of conjugation on B of C. And the theorem of DuPont and Saar is that this B of C minus 1 is equal to this scissors congruence group to the Dane invariant kernel. But the plus one eigenspace also has meaning. The plus one eigenspace is a little bit more complicated. It's the Dane invariant kernel for S3. Now when you're looking at scissors congruence for S3, you can think of the whole of S3 as giving an element in here. And it turns out that in B of C plus, this is 0. And you're actually getting the quotient by all rational multiples of that canonical element. So you get this. And. Uh, And in fact, what's happening here is that B of C, remember that B of C, I said, was the same thing as H3 of PSL2 <coughs> C made discrete with Z coefficients. It was this modulo its torsion subgroup, modulo the Q mod C. And if, if instead we don't mod out the torsion subgroup, if we take the whole of H3 of PSL 2C made discrete Z, this is actually D of S3 modulo the integers. The integers simply multiples of S3 itself. Now that the Chern Simons invariant vanishes on the minus eigenspace. So we have 
the Chern Simons invariant is zero on, sorry, yes, it vanishes on the minus eigenspace. This comes from the fact that Chern Simons invariant is oriental orientation sensitive. So it's really a map from from H3, oh, I should have said the plus eigenspace. Yes, yeah, sorry. And here we have the same conjugation action and I'm taking the plus eigenspace. The minus eigenspace doesn't have the torsion in it, and so it's the same as B of C minus. But the plus eigenspace of this homology group is this. So the chern simons invariant from PSL to C. Z. In these terms, interpreting this as scissors congruence, as a map to, it was R modulo pi squared Z. This actually turns out to be volume. It's volume on D of S3 mod Z. Now I'm actually... The reason that we're getting a mismatch here, the Z here I said was generated by S3. S3 actually has volume 4 pi um, actually has volume 4 pi squared Z. So, so we're seeing a mismatch. There should really be a 4 pi squared. Um, and what I said about in this relationship, if we replace SL by PSL, what I said is exactly true. The PSL, it's actually one quarter of S3 that you have to factor by. There's this Z4 difference between homology of PSL and SL. If we use SL, we've got a 4 pi squared, and we're seeing volume absolutely matching up. But let me just leave it written as I've written it. Oh, my notes are over here. Would you, would you give an example of an element of DC minus one? I cannot imagine that. Uh, yeah, any, any hyperbolic manifold with zero churn Simons, in fact, lies in here. Any, any hyperbolic manifold which admits an orientation reversing homeomorphism lies in BC minus 1. Okay, because an orientation reversing homeomorphism induces the conjugation action, but because the or orientation is flipped, there's also a sign involved when you think of it as an element of here. So it's actually conjugation times minus 1. So that's what flipping orientation of a hyperbolic manifold does. And so if you've got an orientation reversing homeomorphism of a three-manifold that lies in there. So just uh, going back to the conjecture about Dane invariant sufficiency, and the the sufficiency of Dane invariant conjecture would imply, so if vol and Dane invariant are sufficient, then, in other words, then the volume map from, well, now we know it, that we can think of it as B, C minus to R, is injective and this is if you assume this for H3 and if you assume it also for S3 you've got it also on BC plus and and so then you and both of these had countable image so what you then get is that the block group is countable So the block group is countable. So the Dane invariant sufficiency conjecture implies the conjecture that the block group is countable. 
And this conjecture is called the rigidity conjecture. So the rigidity conjecture says that BC is countable. This is equivalent to saying that BC is equal to B of the algebraic closure of Q. This is not too hard to prove that these two statements are equivalent to each other. And this is simply the union over all finite fields of B, of, or maybe I should say the direct limit over all finite fields of B of the finite field. Okay? And remember that B of a finite field is simply up to torsion a finitely generated Z module. And it's interesting that in the limit you get something that's now a Q vector space. So things are becoming more and more divisible as you go to larger and larger field extensions. Okay. So So this is scissors congruence. And now that I'd like to simply describe how the invariance we've given completely determines scissors congruence. So theorem, if we have M1 and M2 hyperbolic manifolds, what I'll do is I'll choose a field K that contains the invariant trace fields of both. So K, the smallest field would be, I take the join of the invariant trace field of the one and the invariant trace field of the other. So this is a subset. These are concrete fields. So this is, by this I mean the join of the two fields, the smallest field generated by the two. This will again be a number field in C. And then M1 is scissors congruent to M2 if and only if there exists an element alpha in the block group of this capital K intersected with the reals. such that if I take the Borel invariant, remember the Borel invariant is I simply take all of the complex embeddings of K, and for each one I look at volume. So it's the vector consisting of volumes for the complex embeddings of K. So I look at the Borel invariant of M1, the set of volumes at the embeddings of K for M1, I look at the Borel invariant for M2. This should be the Borel invariant of this element alpha. So in particular, the generic situation, as we've al already remarked, is that if you take some random number field and intersect with R, it's typically equal to Q. So in that case, this is simply saying that scissors congruence is exactly equality of the Borel invariants. So we get a very nice solution to scissors congruence of hyperbolic three manifolds in these terms. So let me now, and I want to move on to another topic, but last time, I wanted to state some problems, and I got to the end of my lecture without time to state the problems, so I think I'll move on to the new topic after stating a list of problems, and maybe not be able to discuss all of the problems. So here are some problems based on what we've talked about, about so far. So. So the first one directly from what I've been talking about here is to prove the 
Dane invariant sufficiency for H3 and S3. And this, it's maybe foolish to call it a problem, and it's a long-standing conjecture that this is true. It's equivalent to the conjecture that if you take the churn simons class, remember this was a map from H3 of PSL 2C made discrete with Z coefficients to C modulo pi squared Z. It's equivalent to the conjecture that this is actually injected. And there's a story which I gather has a grain of truth to it. And Ch the Chern Simons invariant was invented by, as its name implies, Chern and Jim Simons. And Jim Simons had this beautiful invariant, the Chern Simons invariant, and was trying to compute it for various manifolds. And it was defined as he first defined it, it was only defined modulo Q. It was maybe a little bit later that it was realized it could be defined modulo multiples, Z multiples of pi squared rather than Q multiples of pi squared. And he absolutely could not prove that it was ever non-trivial in those terms. And it's still not proved that it's ever non-trivial in those terms, that it's ever not equal to a rational number. But he was so frustrated by this that he left mathematics and went into finance, which is why we have wonderful Simons Institutes around the world now and things like that. So, <laughs> so sometimes not being able to solve a problem has unexpected consequences. <laughs> so that's problem one. And if you don't solve it, if you try to do it and don't solve it, you can found new research institutes instead. <laughs> so the second problem is very much related to something that Craig was asking about, this question of commensurability of manifolds. If, if we knew a lower bound for the volume of a manifold, then it would be much easier to decide about commensurability of manifolds. So what is the minimal volume of a manifold with given among manifolds with given a k of m or even k of m and a of m? Because if we have a manifold we're looking at and knew that there were no manifolds, say, of smaller volume, then we'd know that anything commensurable to it is a covering, for example. So this is an interesting question. We could ask this in the Dane group and given, in the block group, given an element in B of K, We've got the volume map from B of K, which, as we know, actually goes to a discrete subgroup of R. OK? For a particular embedding of K into the complex numbers, this goes to a discrete subgroup of R. So there's a minimal volume. What is the minimal volume for given? Okay. Now then this is something that's been very much studied. There's the Lichtenbaum conjecture, which essentially asks the analogous thing for K theory. But the the connection, the issues of torsion and so on, the exact connection between block group and K theory, until very recently, until Christian Zickert's recent work has been rather obscure. And the literature on this is really rather, rather hard to understand and get through. But I think that with Zickert's work, there's maybe 
first of all, one can certainly now sit down and say exactly what the K-theoretic Lichtenbaum conjecture would imply for the block group. That wasn't clear until this point. But also, then one can try to prove it. And the Lichtenbaum conjecture gives an explicit conjectured lower bound. So problem number three is what I'm going to talk about once I've written down all the problems. And that is, for given k or given k and a, do they always exist? Hyperbolic free manifolds. And I would conjecture that the answer is yes. And this has been a long-standing question of mine and Alan Reed's. We first asked it back in the early 90s. And we were able to prove that the answer was yes when A was trivial and K was a multi-quadratic extension of the rationals. And that's basically the only very general case other than arithmetic manifolds where one has answers. So arithmetic ans manifolds give answers when k only has one complex place. And I'll say a bit after I've written down the problems of why I believe the, the answer should be yes. But we can go actually further. Can one generate b of k by such manifolds. This would basically ask, if you look at this minimal volume that is given by the Lichtenbaum conjecture, if the Lichtenbaum conjecture is true, that that is a minimal volume. It's practically saying, it's not exactly saying, but it may be not too hard to show that it is exactly saying, that it's saying that if you could generate B of K by such manifolds, then minimal volume is, is attained, is, is this volume. So it would be linking the two parts of question two. And again, this seems like a, maybe I won't call this a conjecture because it seems very optimistic. But there's a certain amount of experimental evidence that it has a reasonable chance. And there are certainly no obstructions to it being true. And this would be saying that the set of hyperbolic manifolds is extraordinarily rich because I'm, you've got a huge number of number fields to each a huge number of quaternion algebras. And then generating the whole of B of, B of K is giving you something very, it's actually to some extent an additional independent direction to find examples. There was a question somewhere, I think. I was asking, does it make any difference if you have like overholds versus manifolds here? Uh, that's a, it does make a difference because orbifolds, orbifolds don't really, really lie in B of K. They lie in B of K tensored with Q. So only once you've gotten rid of the singularities by taking a manifold cover do you get something there. Keep on. Losing my notes. So the next question is. Yeah. That's 
right. So as a vector, and we're, we're taking the Borel regulator for the field K. So we're doing, we're getting a vector over all of the complex embeddings of the field K. And we're saying that this vector minus this vector should be equal to this vector. That's right. We're looking at the embeddings of K into C. And of course, since these two fields are subfields, each of those will induce embeddings of the subfield. Let's see. I think I'll skip the next problem because it would take a little bit too long to describe. And the one after that is, OK. So next one is. This is actually problem six. Maybe I'll have time to come back and tell you problems four and five, but maybe not. But if M3 has a spin structure, you can think of a spin structure as simply a lift of the representation of the fundamental group into PSL2C to a representation into SL2C. We get a class in H3 of sl to C made discrete with Z coefficients, which is the SL extended block group. So this is a very nicely described group. It's a combinatorially described in terms of simplex shapes. Okay? So the question is. How does one find a representative for this class in B hat of SLC? The point being, when you triangulate M, you've got the simplex shapes. But then you have to find this combinatorial structure, which is this flattening where you adjust the angles now by even multiples of pi so that the sum of angles around edges goes to zero. And it's a, in the ordering of the vertices of a simplex, you're adjusting the angles just on these by even multiples. You necessarily have to, so we're numbering zero, one, two, three. These will get be only adjusted by even multiples. On this one, you're doing odd multiples. So it's a kind of odd and restrictive sort of adjusting of angles. And it turns out to be very hard to do this adjustment to get an element in here. And it may even, yeah, I think there are cases where it's actually impossible. And so it would be very nice to have something that does this computation efficiently. I should mention at this point, I've been talking about the class in these groups. And I've kind of been suggesting that it exists for non-compact manifolds. It does, in fact, exist for non-compact manifolds. If M3 is non-compact, then it doesn't have a fundamental class. But I can look at M3 module of the cusps, and that does have a fundamental class, and that lies in H3 of PSL 2C modulo the parabolic subgroup with Z coefficients. And it turns out that there exists a natural section from this group, so there exists a map back to H3 of PSL 2C with Z coefficients. And so that's how you get the class when you do have cusps. You first get the class here, and then you map to here. So this was described in my original paper on the extended block group, but somewhat carelessly. Christian Zickert later pointed out that the class you get in here is not absolutely well defined. It's only well defined after you choose horror sections at the cusps. But nevertheless, the image here is well defined. So luckily, my carelessness 
didn't lead to an incorrect definition. So it's carefully described in a later paper of Christian Zickert. So that's where that comes from. And now then, if you've got a manifold with spin structure, so H3SL2C, again, parabolic Z, here it turns out that M3 cusps doesn't lie in here. You have to factor by Z mod 2. So when you have cusps, you don't get a class. In SL, you get a class mod 2. And in particular, the Chern-Simons invariant, which is defined modulo 4 pi squared here, is only defined modulo 2 pi squared here. If you look in the physics literature, you'll see physicists talking about Chern-Simons mod 4 pi very cheerfully for non-compact manifolds. It simply doesn't exist. It's only defined modulo. The talk will be a discussion of that problem three. So the issue is, the problem is we're, we're given a concrete number field, k. So k comes with a given embedding, which I'll call tau 1, into c. Okay, A concrete number field and a quaternion algebra, a k, a quaternion algebra over k. Find an M3 with K of M3 equal to K as a concrete number field, A of M3 equal to A. Ah, just A, I'll call it. Okay. So we can do this. Um, for A equal to the matrix algebra. Um, actually, can we do it also? So, so for multi-quadratic extensions of, yeah. A equals M2 for multi-quadratic extensions of Q. So simply repeated quadratic extensions. This is described actually in Alan Reed's book with McLaughlin. And I forget, do you also do compact examples in the book? You do. OK. But you would, can we get any quaternion algebra? Not yet. Not yet. OK. And of course, arithmetic manifolds, you can do this if R2 is equal to 1 for any A. Simply, arithmetic manifolds give you your examples. But this is all that's known. These are the only general cases proved, plus one has a few million examples computed. Well, a few thousand examples co computed. Oh, it's for any A ramified at all real places. Very important. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so we're very far from knowing the answer to this, but, but here is an approach that I've been thinking about now for, yeah, almost 20 years, and it, I feel it just needs a new idea, but I haven't had the new idea. So what we'll do is we'll start with our k and our a, and for each complex embedding tau i of k to c, ah, 
Sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me not yet say this. What we simply do is we'll choose a maximal order first, or choose an order, any order. Choose an order O in A, and we'll put gamma equal to O1 and projectifies. So this is O1 modulo plus or minus 1. So this sits inside of PSL 2C using the embedding of K, the tau 1 embedding in 2C. Now then, for each complex embedding, tau i of k into c, we get a different representation, a different embedding of gamma into PSL 2c. Okay? Well, for each unramified real embedding, Let me call these rho j. These are k to the real numbers. And j is going to go from 1 up to, I'll call it r1, but r1 upper u. So say I'm only looking at the unramified embeddings. This is the number of unramified embeddings. OK. We get a mapping now. The quaternion algebra tensor with r becomes 2 by 2 matrices over r, so gamma ends up in PSL 2R. And using these various embeddings, gamma in PSL 2C acts on H3, so I get gamma acts on a total of R2 different H3s, so H3 cross H3 cross H3, R2 times, and then a total of R1U different H2s. And the proof that, that Alan Reed gave that this acts discreetly, if you look at it, you'll see that you can essentially use the same proof well, for an arithmetic group that you get a discrete action, you can see that this gamma acts discreetly on this product. And in fact, with finite co-volume, so I'm going to put y equal to this h3 to the r2 cross h2 to the r1u modulo gamma, this is a manifold, or an orbifold. Let me actually, by going, to a finite, by going to a subgroup of finite index, let me make it a manifold. So let me call this gamma 0. This is in gamma of finite index to make sure I have a manifold. I get a manifold of very large dimension. Now then, the very first factor here is the one we're interested in. So let me take the projection. I'll take the projection of H3 cross H3 cross H2 cross H2. I'll project this to just the second factor, h3, I'll drop the first factor and keep all the rest. Okay. This is the projection and the fibers give a codimension 3 foliation on on this h3 to the r2 cross h2 to the r1 upper u. 
And this is invariant, of course. This product structure is preserved by the group action. And I'll call this foliation F on the quotient, on the quotient Y, which is the quotient of this by the action. Pardon? I'm taking the projection that omits the first factor. So the first factor here is the one that I've omitted. I've removed this. I'm just taking all the other factors. And now we have the following fairly easy theorem, actually. Suppose M3 is just an abstract manifold which immerses into Y transversally to the foliation F. So suppose we have this transverse section possibly immersed to the foliation F, where M3 is, say, compact. Well, let's say compact for the moment. Then M3 is hyperbolic with K of M3 contained in K, A of M3 contained in A. Possibly not equal. If there are subfields, it might actually be smaller, but at least invariant trace field and invariant quaternion algebra are restricted to be in this. So if we can find simply a compact transversal, um, then we get this hyperbolic structure. The point being that if you're transversal, there's a transversal hyperbolic structure to the foliation everywhere. So anything that lies transversally to it is inheriting a hyperbolic structure locally that fits together to a global hyperbolic structure. And if M3 is non-compact, we look at that hyperbolic structure and we ask that it be finite volume. Okay, we, or we ask that it be complete simply. And in that situation, well, complete of finite volume, in that situation you could also extend this then to non-compact M3. So if you've got an M3 which is transverse where this inherited hyperbolic structure has finite volume, then it is an example of the type we're looking for. And conversely, every M3 satisfying this has a cover, finite cover, which immerses as above. So a finite cover, let me call it M30, with M30 immersing into Y as above. So the problem of realization is really reduced to the problem, does this foliation always have compact transversals? Or does it always have uh, sorry, I do need M3 to have integral traces, satisfying star plus integral traces. Thank you. So the problem reduces now to finding, the, finding these transversals. So I've always been optimistic that this should be true. But as I say, I don't know how to prove it. So let me, since I started late, I think I have about five minutes left, let me very quickly explain a little bit of my optimism. So why should one be optimistic? So 
So the basic problem here is we've got a foliation, we've got a transversally hyperbolic foliation of co-dimension 3 with nice ergodic properties, so nicely behaved, and we're asking, does it always have compact transversals? Okay. And for the surface case, the answer is yes. Now, I should re really put a little question mark after this because I haven't done all the calculations. But the point is, because this is an if and only if theorem, in the surface case, in the surface case hour, we've got a K which is totally real. We've got a quaternion algebra A which is unramified at at least one place. So that in this case, since it's totally th real, there are no H3s, there are only H2s. We've got gamma going into a Y with a co-dimension 2 foliation. And we're now asking for a compact transversal in that situation. So in the two-dimensional case, the H3s aren't there. We only have the H2s. And we're asking for this foliation. As I say in this theorem, it's really equivalent to being able to find a manifold with given trace field and given quaternion algebra. And the char just looking, for example, at the punctured torus. If you look at the punctured torus, it has a very nice, easy deformation variety. You can write down the equation of this deformation variety. Um, let's see if I can find it. I did write it down. It is, or maybe someone remembers it, because there are experts in the room on these. It's minus x, y, z. I couldn't remember. OK, x squared plus y squared plus c squared minus x, y, z is equal to 2 or something or 0. I, yeah, let me just check. Okay. Is equal to 0. Yeah, thanks. There's a different character variety for the four punctured spheres where there are some coefficients in here. OK. And so you're trying to find x, y, z in the given field, solving this equation with the x, y, and z, which are traces in the given field. And it's an exercise to see that you can actually do this. So already, just trying to realize the field, you could do it with a one punctured torus. So that's saying it's fairly easy to find the surfaces to solve this problem. As I said, I haven't done calculations about the quaternion algebra. So there's a question mark after this. Yes, there are more calculations to be done. But I'm sure the answer is yes. And so it's suggesting that there are really no great obstructions to finding these transversals. And so there shouldn't be obstructions in dimension three either. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much.